The School Days of an Indian Girl by Zeet Kalesa Part 1 The Land of Red Apples There were eight in our party of bronzed children who were going east with the missionaries. Among us were three young braves, two tall girls, and we three little ones, Judwin, Thirwin, and I. We had been very impatient to start on our journey to the Red Apple country, which, we were told, lay a little beyond the great circular horizon of the western prairie. Under a sky of rosy apples, we dreamt of roaming as freely, unhappily, as we had chased the cloud shadows on the Dakota plains. We had anticipated much pleasure from a ride on the iron horse, but the throngs of staring pale faces disturbed and troubled us. On the train, fair women with tottering babies on each arm stopped their haste and scrutinized the children of absent mothers. Large men with heavy bundles in their hands halted nearby and riveted their glassy blue eyes upon us. I sank deep into the corner of my seat, for I resented being watched. Directly in front of me, children who were no larger than I hung themselves upon the backs of their seats with their bold white faces toward me. Sometimes they took their forefingers out of their mouths and pointed at my moccasinated feet. Their mothers, instead of reproving such rude curiosity, looked closely at me and attracted their children's further notice to my blankets. This embarrassed me and kept me constantly on the verge of tears. I sat perfectly still, with my eyes downcast, daring only now and then to shoot long glances around me. Chancing to turn to the window at my side, I was quite breathless upon seeing one familiar object. It was the telegraph pole, which strode by at short paces. Very near my mother's dwelling, along the edge of a road, thickly bordered with wild sunflowers, some poles like these had been planted by white men. Often I had stopped on my way down the road to hold my ear against the pole, and, hearing its low moaning, I used to wonder what the pale face had done to hurt it. Now I sat watching for each pole that glided by to be the last one. In this way I had forgotten my uncomfortable surroundings. When I heard one of my comrades call out my name, I saw the missionary standing very near, tossing candies and gums into our midst. This amused us all, and we tried to see who could catch the most of the sweetmates. Though we rode several days inside of the iron horse, I do not recall a single thing about our luncheons. It was night when we reached the school grounds. The lights from the windows of the large buildings fell upon some of the icicle trees that stood beneath them. We were led toward an open door, where the brightness of the lights within flooded out over the heads of the excited pale faces who blocked our way. My body trembled more from fear than from the snow I trod upon. Entering the house, I stood close against the wall, the strong glaring light in the large whitewashed room dazzled my eyes. The noisy hurrying of hard shoes upon a bare wooden floor increased the worrying in my ears. My only safety seemed to be in keeping next to the wall. As I was wondering in which direction to escape from all this confusion, two warm hands grasped me firmly and in the same moment I was tossed high in mid-air. A rosy-cheeked, pale-faced woman caught me in her arms. 
I was both frightened and insulted by such trifling. I stared into her eyes, wishing her to let me stand on my own feet, but she jumped me up and down with increasing enthusiasm. My mother had never made a plaything of her wee daughter. Remembering this, I began to cry aloud. They misunderstood the cause of my tears and placed me at a white table loaded with food. There our party were united again. As I did not hush my crying, one of the older ones whispered to me, Wait until you are alone in the night. It was very little I could swallow besides my sobs that evening. Oh, I want my mother and my brother Davi. I want to go to my aunt, I pleaded. But the ears of the pale faces could not hear me. From the table we were taken along an upward incline of wooden boxes, which I learned afterward to call a stairway. At the top was a quiet hall, dimly lighted. Many narrow beds were in one straight line down the entire length of the wall. In them lay sleeping brown faces, which peeped just out of the coverings. I was tucked into bed with one of the tall girls because she talked to me in my mother tongue and seemed to soothe me. I had arrived in the wonderful land of rosy skies, but I was not happy as I had thought I should be. My long travel and the bewildering sights had exhausted me. I fell asleep, heaving deep, tired sobs. My tears were left to dry themselves in streaks, because neither my aunt nor my mother was near to wipe them away. Part 2 the cutting of my long hair. The first day in the land of apples was a bitter cold one, for the snow still covered the ground and the trees were bare. A large bell rang for breakfast, its loud metallic voice crashing through the belfry overhead and into our sensitive ears. The annoying clatter of shoes on bare floors gave us no peace. The constant clash of harsh noises with an undercurrent of many voices murmuring an unknown tongue made a bedlam within which I was securely tied. And though my spirit tore itself in struggling for its lost freedom, all was useless. A pale-faced woman with white hair came up after us. We were placed in a line of girls who were marching into the dining room. These were Indian girls in stiff shoes and closely clinging dresses. The small girls wore sleeved aprons and shingled hair. As I walked noiselessly in my soft moccasins, I felt like sinking to the floor, for my blanket had been stripped from my shoulders. I looked hard at the Indian girls, who seemed not to care that they were even more immodestly dressed than I in their tightly fitting clothes. While we marched in, the boys entered at an opposite door. I watched for the three young braves who came on our party. I spied them in the rear ranks, looking as uncomfortable as I felt. A small bell was tapped, and each of the pupils drew a chair from under the table. Supposing this act meant they were to be seated, I pulled out mine and at once slipped into it from one side. But when I turned my head, I saw that I was the only one seated, and all the rest at our table remained standing. Just as I began to rise, looking shyly around to see how chairs were to be used, a second bell was sounded. All were seated at last, and I had to crawl back into my chair again. I heard a man's voice at one end of the hall, and I looked around to see him. 
but all the others hung their heads over their plates. As I glanced at the long chain of tables, I caught the eyes of a pale-faced woman upon me. Immediately, I dropped my eyes, wondering why I was so keenly watched by the strange woman. The man ceased his mutterings, and then a third bell was tapped. Everyone picked up his knife and fork and began eating. I began crying instead, for by this time I was afraid to venture anything more. But this eating by formula was not the hardest trial in that first day. Late in the morning, my friend Judwin gave me a terrible warning. Judwin knew a few words of English, and she had overheard the pale-faced woman talk about cutting our long, heavy hair. Our mothers had taught us that only unskilled warriors who were captured had their hair shingled by the enemy. Among our people, short hair was worn by mourners and shingled hair by cowards. We discussed our fate some moments, and when Judwin said, we have to submit because they are strong, I rebelled. No, I will not submit. I will struggle first, I answered. I watched my chance, and when no one noticed, I disappeared. I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could in my squeaking shoes. My moccasins had been exchanged for shoes. Along the hall I passed without knowing whither I was going. Turning aside to an open door, I found a large room with three white beds in it. The windows were covered with dark green curtains, which made the room very dim. Thankful that no one was there, I directed my steps toward the corner furthest from the door. On my hands and knees, I crawled under the bed and cuddled myself in the dark corner. From my hiding place, I peered out, shuddering with fear, whenever I heard footsteps nearby. Though in the hall loud voices were calling my name, and I knew that even Judwin was searching for me, I did not open my mouth to answer. Then the steps were quickened and the voices became excited. The sounds came nearer and nearer. Women and girls entered the room. I held my breath and watched them open closet doors and peep behind large trunks. Someone threw up the curtains and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to stoop and look under the bed, I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Since the day I was taken from my mother, I had suffered extreme indignities. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet. And now my long hair was shingled like a coward's. In my anguish, I mourned for my mother but no one came to comfort me. Not a soul reasoned quietly with me, as my own mother used to do. For now, I was only one of many little animals driven by a herder. Part 3. The Snow Episode A short time after our arrival, we three Dakotas were playing in the snowdrift. We were all still deaf to the English language, excepting Judwin, who always heard such puzzling things. One morning we learned through her ears that we were forbidden to fall lengthwise in the snow, as we had been doing to see our own impressions. However, 
before many hours we had forgotten the order and were having great sport in the snow when a shrill voice called us looking up we saw an imperative hand beckoning us into the house we shook the snow off ourselves and started toward the woman as slowly as we dared jude when said now the pale face is angry with us she is going to punish us for falling into the snow if she looks straight into your eyes and talks loudly you must wait until she stops then after a tiny pause say no the rest of the way we practiced upon the little word no as it happened thorwin was summoned to judgment first the door shut behind her with a click jude ben and i stood silently listening to the keyhole the pale-faced woman talked in very severe tones her words fell from her lips like crackling embers and her inflection ran up like the small end of a switch i understood her voice better than the things she was saying i was certain we had made her very impatient with us jude when heard enough of the words to realize all too late that she had thought us the wrong reply ho oh, poor thorwin she gasped as she put both hands over her ears just then i heard thorwin's tremulous answer no with an angry exclamation the woman gave her a hard spanking then she stopped to say something jude ben said it was this are you going to obey my word the next time so when answered again with the only word at her command no this time the woman meant her blows to smart for the poor frightened girl shrieked at the top of her voice in the midst of the whipping the blow ceased abruptly and the woman asked another question are you going to fall in the snow again thorwin gave her bad password another trial we heard her say feebly no no with this the woman hid away her half worn slipper and let the child out stroking her black shorn head perhaps it occurred to her that brute force is not the solution for such a problem she did nothing to jude when nor to me she only returned to us our unhappy comrade and left us alone in the room during the first two or three seasons misunderstandings as ridiculous as this one of the snow episode frequently took place bringing unjustifiable frights and punishments into our little lives within a year i was able to express myself somewhat in broken english as soon as i comprehended a part of what was said and done a mischievous spirit of revenge possessed me one day i was called in from my play for some misconduct i had disregarded a rule which seemed to me very needlessly binding i was sent into the kitchen to mash the turnips for dinner it was noon and steaming dishes were hastily carried into the dining room i hated turnips and their odor which came from the brown jar was offensive to me with fire in my heart i took the wooden tool that the pale-faced woman held out to me i stood upon a step and grasping the handle with both hands i bent in hot rage over the turnips i worked my vengeance upon them all were so busily occupied that no one noticed me i saw that the turnips were in a pulp and that further beating could not improve them but the order was mash these turnips and mash them i would i renewed my energy and as i sent the masher into the bottom of the jar i felt a satisfying sensation that the weight of my body had gone into it 
Just here, a pale-faced woman came up to my table. As she looked into the jar, she shoved my hands roughly aside. I stood fearless and angry. She placed her red hands upon the rim of the jar. Then she gave one lift and stride away from the table. But lo, the pulpy contents fell through the crumbled bottom to the floor. I, she spared me no scolding phrases that I had earned. I did not heed them. I felt triumphant in my revenge, though deep within me I was a wee bit sorry to have broken the jar. As I sat eating my dinner and saw that no turnips were served, I whooped in my heart for having once asserted the rebellion within me. Part 4 The Devil Among the legends the old warriors used to tell me were many stories of evil spirits. But I was thought to fear them no more than those who talked about in material guise. I never knew there was an insolent chieftain among the bad spirits who dared to array his forces against the great spirit until I heard this white man's legend from a pale-faced woman. Out of a large book, she showed me a picture of the white man's devil. I looked in horror upon the strong claws that grew out of his fur-covered fingers. His feet were like his hands. Trailing at his heels was a scaly tail tipped with a serpent's open jaws. His face was a patchwork. He had bearded cheeks like some I had seen pale faces wear. His nose was an eagle's bill, and his sharp pointed ears were pricked up like those of a sly fox. Above them a pair of cow's horns curved upward. I trembled with awe, and my heart throbbed in my throat as I looked at the king of evil spirits. Then I heard the pale-faced woman say that this terrible creature roamed loose in the world and that little girls who disobeyed school regulations were to be tortured by him. That night I dreamt about this evil divinity. Once again I seemed to be in my mother's cottage. An Indian woman had come to visit my mother. On opposite sides of the kitchen stove, which stood in the center of the small house, my mother and her guest were seated in straight-backed chairs. I played with a train of empty spools hitched together on a string. It was night, and the wick burned feebly. Suddenly, I heard someone turn our doorknob from without. My mother and the woman hushed their talk and both looked toward the door. It opened gradually. I waited behind the stove. The hinges squeaked as the door was slowly, very slowly pushed inward. Then in rushed the devil. He was tall. He looked exactly like the picture I had seen of him in the white man's papers. He did not speak to my mother because he did not know the Indian language. But his glittering yellow eyes were fastened upon me. He took long strides around the stove, passing behind the woman's chair. I threw down my spools and ran to my mother. He did not fear her, but followed closely after me. Then I ran round and round the stove, crying aloud for help. But my mother and the woman seemed not to know my danger. They sat still, looking quietly upon the devil's chase after me. At last I grew dizzy. My head revolved as on a hidden pivot. My knees became numb and doubled under my weight like a pair of knife blades without a spring. Beside my mother's chair I fell in a heap. Just as the devil stooped over me, with overstretched claws, my mother awoke from her quiet indifference and lifted me on her lap.
whereupon the devil vanished and I was awake. On the following morning, I took my revenge upon the devil. Stealing into the room where a wall of shelves was filled with books, I drew forth the stories of the Bible. With a broken slate pencil I carried in my apron pocket, I began by scratching out his wicked eyes. A few moments later, when I was ready to leave the room, there was a ragged hole in the page where the picture of the devil had once been. Part 5 Iron Routine A loud clamoring bell awakened us at half past six in the cold winter mornings. From happy dreams of western rolling lands and unlessowed freedom, we tumbled out upon chilly bare floors back again into a pale-faced day. We had short time to jump into our shoes and clothes and wet our eyes with icy water before a small handbell was vigorously rung for roll call. There were too many drowsy children and too numerous orders for the day to waste a moment in any apology to nature for giving her children such a shock in the early morning. We rushed downstairs, bounding over two high steps at a time, to land in the assembly room. A pale-faced woman with a yellow-covered roll book open on her arm and a gnawed pencil in her hand, appeared at the door. Her small, tired face was coldly lighted with a pair of large grey eyes. She stood still in a halo of authority, while over the rim of her spectacles her eyes pried nervously about the room. Having glanced at her long list of names and called out the first one, she tossed up her chin and peered through the crystals of her spectacles to make sure of the answer here. Relentlessly, her pencil blackmarked our daily records. If we were not present to respond to our names, and no chum of ours had done it successfully for us, no matter if a dull headache or the painful cough of slow consumption had delayed the absentee, there was only time enough to mark the tardiness. It was next to impossible to leave the iron routine after the civilizing machine had once begun its day's buzzing, and as it was inbred in me to suffer in silence rather than to appeal to the ears of one whose open eyes could not see my pain, I have many times trudged in the day's harness heavy-footed like a dumb, sick brute. Once I lost a dear classmate. I remember well how she used to mop along at my side, until one morning she could not raise her head from her pillow. At her deathbed I stood weeping, as the pale-faced woman sat near her moistening the dry lips. Among the folds of the bedclothes, I saw the open pages of the white man's Bible. The dying Indian girl talked disconnectedly of Jesus the Christ and the pale face who was cooling her swollen hands and feet. I grew bitter and censured the woman for cruel neglect of our physical ills. I despised the pencils that moved automatically and the one teaspoon which dealt out from a large bottle, healing to a row of variously ailing Indian children. I blamed the hard-working, well-meaning, ignorant woman who was inculcating in our hearts her superstitious ideas. Though I was sullen in all my little troubles, as soon as I felt better, I was ready again to smile upon the cruel woman. Within a week, I was again actively testing the chains which tightly bound my individuality like a mummy for burial. The melancholy of those black days has left so long a shadow 
that it darkens the path of years that have since gone by. These sad memories rise about those of smoothly grinding school days. Perhaps my Indian nature is the moaning wind which stirs them now for their present record. But however tempestuous this is within me, it comes out as the low voice of a curiously colored sea shell, which is only for those ears that are bent with compassion to hear it. Part 6. Four Strange Summers after my first three years of school, I roamed again in the western country through four strange summers. During this time, I seemed to hang in the heart of chaos, beyond the touch or voice of human aid. My brother, being almost ten years my senior, did not quite understand my feelings. My mother had never gone inside of a schoolhouse and so she was not capable of comforting her daughter, who could read and write. Even nature seemed to have no place for me. I was neither a wee girl nor a tall one, neither a wild Indian nor a tame one. This deplorable situation was the effect of my brief course in the East and the unsatisfactory teens in a girl's ears. It was under these trying conditions that, one bright afternoon, as I sat restless and unhappy in my mother's cabin, I caught the sound of the spirited step of my brother's pony on the road, which passed by our dwelling. Soon I heard the wheels of a light buckboard and Dowie's familiar ho to his pony. He alighted upon the bare ground in front of our house. Tying his pony to one of the projecting corner logs of the low-roofed cottage, he stepped upon the wooden doorstep. I met him there with a hurried greeting, and as I passed by, he looked a quiet word into my eyes. When he began talking with my mother, I slipped the rope from the pony's bridle. Seizing the reins and raising my feet against the dashboard, I wheeled around in an instant. The pony was ever ready to try his speed. Looking backward, I saw Darby waving his hand to me. I turned with a curve in the road and disappeared. I followed the winding road, which crawled upward, between the bases of little hillocks. Deep water-worn ditches ran parallel on either side. A strong wind blew against my cheeks and fluttered my sleeves. The pony reached the top of the highest hill and began an even race on the level lands. There was nothing moving within that great circular horizon of the Dakota prairies save the tall grasses over which the wind blew and rolled off in long shadowy waves. Within this vast wigwam of blue and green, I rode reckless and insignificant. It satisfied my small consciousness to see the white foam fly from the pony's mouth. Suddenly, out of the earth, a coyote came forth at a swinging trot that was taking the cunning thief toward the hills and the village beyond. Upon the moment's impulse, I gave him a long chase and a wholesome fright. As I turned away to go back to the village, the wolf sank down upon his haunches for rest, for it was a hot summer day. And as I drove slowly homeward, I saw his sharp nose still pointed at me until I vanished below the margin of the hilltops. In a little while, I came in sight of my mother's house. Dawi stood in the yard, laughing at an old warrior who was pointing his forefinger and again waving his whole hand toward the hills. With his blanket drawn over one shoulder, he talked and motioned excitedly. Dawi 
turned the old man by the shoulder and pointed me out to him. Ho Han! Ho yes, the warrior muttered, and went his way. He had climbed the top of his favorite barren hill to survey the surrounding prairies, when he spied my chase after the coyote. His keen eyes recognized the pony and driver. At once, uneasy for my safety, he had come running to my mother's cabin to give her warning. I did not appreciate his kindly interest, for there was an unrest gnawing at my heart. As soon as he went away, I asked Dawi about something else. No, my baby sister, I cannot take you with me to the party tonight, he replied. Though I was not far from fifteen, and I felt that before long I should enjoy all the privileges of my tall cousin, Dawi persisted in calling me his baby sister. That moonlight night, I cried in my mother's presence when I heard the jolly young people pass by our cottage. They were no more young braves in blankets and eagle plumes, nor Indian maids with prettily painted cheeks. They had gone three years to school in the East and had become civilized. The young men wore the white man's coat and trousers with bright neckties. The girls wore tight muslin dresses with ribbons at neck and waist. At these gatherings, they talked English. I could speak English almost as well as my brother, but I was not properly dressed to be taken along. I had no hat, no ribbons, and no close-fitting gown. Since my return from school, I had thrown away my shoes and wore again the soft moccasins. While Dawi was busily preparing to go, I controlled my tears. But when I heard him bounding away on his pony, I buried my face in my arms and cried hot tears. My mother was troubled by my unhappiness. Coming to my side, she offered me the only printed matter we had in our home. It was an Indian Bible given her some years ago by a missionary. She tried to console me. Here, my child, are the white man's papers. Read a little from them, she said most piously. I took it from her hand for her sake, but my enraged spirit felt more like burning the book, which afforded me no help and was a perfect delusion to my mother. I did not read it, but laid it unopened on the floor, where I sat on my feet, the dim yellow light of the braided muslin burning in a small vessel of oil flickered and sizzled in the awful silent storm which followed my rejection of the Bible. Now my wrath against the fates consumed my tears before they reached my eyes. I sat stony with a bowed head. My mother threw a shawl over her head and shoulders and stepped out into the night. After an uncertain solitude, I was suddenly aroused by a loud cry piercing the night. It was my mother's voice wailing among the barren hills which held the bones of buried warriors. She called aloud for her brother's spirits to support her in her helpless misery. My fingers grey icy cold, as I realized that my unrestrained tears had betrayed my suffering to her and she was grieving for me. Before she returned, though I knew she was on her way, for she had ceased her weeping, I extinguished the light and leaned my head on the window sill. Many schemes of running away from my surroundings hovered about in my mind. A few more moons of such a turmoil 
drove me away to the eastern school. I rode on the white man's iron steed, thinking it would bring me back to my mother in a few winters, when I should be grown tall and there would be congenial friends awaiting me. Part 7 Incurring My Mother's Displeasure in the second journey to the east, I had not come without some precautions. I had a secret interview with one of our best medicine men, and when I left his wigwam, I carried securely in my sleeve a tiny bunch of magic roots. This position assured me of friends wherever I should go. So absolutely did I believe in its charms that I wore it through all the school routine for more than a year. Then, before I lost my faith in the dead roots, I lost the little buckskin bag containing all my good luck. At the close of the second term of three years, I was the proud owner of my first diploma. The following autumn, I ventured upon a college career against my mother's will. I had written for her approval, but in her reply I found no encouragement. She called my notice to her neighbor's children, who had completed their education in three years. They had returned to their homes and were then talking English with the frontier settlers. Her few words hinted that I had better give up my slow attempt to learn the white man's ways and be content to roam over the prairies and find my living upon wild roots. I silenced her by deliberate disobedience. Thus, homeless and heavy-hearted, I began anew my life among strangers. As I hid myself in my little room, in the college dormitory, away from the scornful and yet curious eyes of the students. I pined for sympathy. Often I wept in secret, wishing I had gone west to be nourished by my mother's love, instead of remaining among a cold race whose hearts were frozen hard with prejudice. During the fall and winter seasons, I scarcely had a real friend, though by that time several of my classmates were courteous to me at a safe distance. My mother had not yet forgiven my rudeness to her, and I had no moment for letter writing. By daylight and lamplight, I spun with reeds and thistles, until my hands were tired from their weaving the magic design which promised me the white man's respect. At length, in the spring term, I entered an oratorical contest among the various classes. As the day of competition approached, it did not seem possible that the event was so near at hand, but it came. In the chapel, the classes assembled together with their invited guests, the high platform was carpeted and gaily festooned with college colors. A bright white light illuminated the room and outlined clearly the great polished beams that arched the domed ceiling. The assembled crowds filled the air with pulsating murmurs. When the hour for speaking arrived, all were hushed, but on the wall, the old clock, which pointed out the trying moment, ticked calmly on. One after another, I saw and heard the orators. Still, I could not realize that they longed for the favorable decision of the judges as much as I did. Each contestant received a loud burst of applause, and some were cheered heartily. Too soon my turn came and I paused a moment behind the curtains for a deep breath. After my concluding words, I heard the same applause that the others had called out. Upon my retreating steps, I was astounded to receive from my fellow students a large bouquet of roses, 
tied with flowing ribbons. With the lovely flowers, I fled from the stage. This friendly token was a rebuke to me for the hard feelings I had borne them. Later, the decision of the judges awarded me the first place. Then there was a mad uproar in the hall, where my classmates sang and shouted my name at the top of their lungs, and the disappointed students howled and brayed in fearfully dissonant tin trumpets. In this excitement, happy students rushed forward to offer their congratulations. And I could not conceal a smile when they wished to escort me in a procession to the students' parlor, where all were going to calm themselves. Thanking them for the kind spirit which prompted them to make such a proposition, I walked alone with the night to my own little room. A few weeks afterward, I appeared as the college representative in another contest. This time, the competition was among orators from different colleges in our state. It was held at the state capitol in one of the largest opera houses. Here again was a strong prejudice against my people. In the evening, as the great audience filled the house, the student bodies began warring among themselves. Fortunately, I was spared witnessing any of the noisy wrangling before the contest began. The slurs against the Indian that stained the lips of our opponents were already burning like a dry fever within my breast. But after the orations were delivered, a deeper burn awaited me. There, before that vast ocean of ice, some college rowdies threw out a large white flag with a drawing of a most forlorn Indian girl on it. Under this, they had printed in bold black letters words that ridiculed the college, which was represented by a squaw. Such worse than barbarian rudeness embittered me. While we waited for the verdict of the judges, I gleamed fiercely upon the throngs of pale faces. My teeth were hard set as I saw the white flag still floating insolently in the air. Then, anxiously, we watched the man carry toward the stage the envelope containing the final decision. There were two prizes given that night, and one of them was mine. The evil spirit laughed within me when the white flag dropped out of sight, and the hands which hurled it hung limp in defeat. Leaving the crowd as quickly as possible, I was soon in my room. The rest of the night I sat in an armchair and gazed into the crackling fire. I laughed no more in triumph when thus alone. The little taste of victory did not satisfy a hunger in my heart. In my mind, I saw my mother far away on the western plains, and she was holding a charge against me. End of section 2